Hi, Doug. I got your note. Hello, Don. Hey. Matteo. Buongiorno. Jeffrey? Marco, I need to leave a little bit early tonight, just let you know. Okay, thanks. Terry also uh, let me know that she might have guests coming over um, as she did last week, so she may or may not be able to join us. And Doug uh, is uh, going to be in transit, so he's going to be joining us in about an hour. But he's going to be, I guess, listening in, or at least uh, logged in. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Hello. And Mikhail. Hello. And then there were seven. <laughs> Give it a couple of minutes. It's just two after the top of the hour. I'm not saying I've kept up. I'm falling. I'm falling off the base now. <laughs> How far have you gotten, Derwin? Well, I've been trying a little bit of what Don suggested. That I've, I'm reading a couple of those later chapters. Um, so I guess I'm read one of the last six. One and a half of the last six is what I've read in the last week. Those are long chapters. Yeah. You're going to get me in trouble, Derwin. I'm going to get a paper. <laughs> My paper version for, for this kind of deep study, I don't know, the Kindle is it's a little tricky for me. Like, I can't navigate as well. Did you look for the PDF online? Uh, oh, There's, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I just, I don't like reading online anyway. I, I didn't need to take attention here. I just no, it's fine. mentioning that. You don't have one of these things? <laughs> coming it's coming well it's, it's, i think it's relevant to know for this got one coming. talk about uh because insofar as we're, we're maybe reading different parts of the text or focusing in on different themes uh we might want to find out what you know, what we really have in common as far as our areas of concern or inquiry or what we want to explore together um and also to you know just review what, what the conversation, where the conversation itself is going. Or last week we were calling it the field. Um, so I, I, I'm, I, I don't think it's irrelevant uh, where we are, what we've read, or what's been going on. I think it's actually part of the, the, um, the reading. I'm actually caught up. Um, I was behind uh, on the weekend. I had only read, I, I was 10 chapters behind, or nine chapters. But I'm caught up now. I um, I just assumed it was five every time, so I'm actually in the middle of the, <coughs> of the matter knot or the knot of matter, which is, I guess, the next chapter on the. I love that chapter. I think it's mm. ordinary, but. Uh, <laughs> and and there was some uh, conversation in the forum on the question of matter and the physical and the reality of matter and the physical, uh, how science may look at that or how physics may look at that. I thought that was interesting. And that chapter is one that I've listened to. Uh, so um, I'm, kind, I'm, I, I'm, kind, I'm caught up in the sense that I've listened to the latest chapter on the schedule, uh, but I haven't read and I think not, certainly not deeply enough, the chapters leading up to it. 
uh, of the last week. I read the first one on life uh, or on the ascent of life. And not the, the one that I missed was on the double soul in man. So matter would be uh, interesting for me to, to talk about or to hear about and learn about um, and life as well. But really, it's, I understand part of laying out of uh, a sequence of, well, we can talk about this later, but uh, emergence, uh, life, mind, matter, the body, and how those relate to these uh, superstructures or supra uh, entities. Uh, but that, again, is uh, maybe getting ahead of ourselves. Where, where are you guys at, uh, Fred and Matteo? Well, I'm definitely not caught up. Uh, <laughs> I have to admit that. Um, I, I did look pretty closely at the problem of uh, at the, um, the ascent of life and the problem of life. And uh, I read, I've been trying to catch up. I read as much as I could of the, the large amount of material that comes before that. But um, I'm to begin, I think I'm beginning to find my way around. Um, but I did love skimming too. And this is not a book that can be skimmed. So um, I'm still a little disoriented. I had fallen a little bit behind, but I got caught up. But I also abandoned uh, the aspiration of having a double reading through it. I started the first two sessions. I did have read each chapter twice. I just haven't had time. So I just finished. The last chapter I read was Matter. So I didn't. I was left in knots and not sure why. <laughs> A book that needs to be reread, and so I, I, I'm not really reading it for its full depth. I'm kind of reading it for a sense of where it's going as a whole, with the idea that I would come back to it for a deeper reading. You know. One, one thing that's interesting and is a little bit difficult for people is uh, that it start the, the whole part one is metaphysics and part two is epistemology. And so in part two, he starts explaining all the experience on which the metaphysics was founded. Right. I'm not going to say it's backwards, but it's, uh, it's sometimes easier. Sometimes people uh, recommend starting with part two and going back to part one. That's a, yeah, that's a great, great point, Mateo. I, I think that if you're not familiar with this, book one can be really, really misleading in terms of what he's doing. And you're right. When you get to the end of, end of the first part of book two, he's describing knowledge by identity, which is like the supermind. He's describing the experience. You go back and reread book one, and, you, and my experience has always been I totally misread book one. I go through book two and like, oh my God, it's so different. I just gotten up to, um, this is related to the conversation Jeffrey and I were having. This is the first book I think ever published by a major science organization. This is published by the American Psychological Association, which is incredibly conservative. It's called Transcendent Minds by a mathematician psychologist in Toronto, which is just, it just takes for granted that all of parapsychological research is valid, that the universe is sort of encased in a transcendent mind. And it's just, it's astonishing. I've been looking at this stuff for 50 years. I've never seen anything like this from a mainstream scientific organization. And they just came out two months ago with a whole journal issue, uh, again, entirely positive towards parapsychology. And the psychologists are- Change. The psychologists are like, I know as a psychologist, they are, 60% of physicists think psi is compatible with, with um, quantum physics. Like 45% of biologists, it's like 25% of psychologists will even, will do anything but put their fingers in their ears and scream, if you mention parapsychology. I mean, they're just, they're so passionately hating anything with parapsychology. And Americans are the worst in the world. Indians are pretty okay. Japanese are fine with it. But Americans just... I, I know some of the people who have like worldwide reputations as side bashers 
and I try to talk to them. And for the American Psychological Association to publish this is like unbelievable. So, transcendent mind. Very boring read, by the way. <laughs> Typical APA book. <laughs> nice plug, though. Yeah. I, uh, oh, Lauren is in the waiting wow. room, so why don't we let her in? And how about um, see where she's at? Uh, we could meditate a bit. And um, are, do we want to talk about matter? Uh, that's been a few shared by a few different folks, and it's fairly, I think, related to this question of the transcendent mind. Um, there's another book that we've studied with Ed as well called Irreducible Mind, uh, and that's yeah. Um, so let me let Lauren in. Good. Hey, Lauren. Hi. We were just catching up uh, as to like where we each are at in the text. Um, Don introduced the book Transcendent Mind, uh, and we were going to start meditating. But how have you been? I've been good. I was kind of on a vacation, which is why I missed the uh, call last week. And I'm a little bit behind on the reading because of that. Um, and I might actually have to jump off Hi. today. But Hi. I'm here and I want to check in and see where you guys are. Hi. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Oro. <laughs> I've kind of been on a vacation myself. Uh, last weekend, as I mentioned at the end of the last week's call, I was going to a reunion <coughs> in the mountains with some old friends and people I volunteered with. And a couple of them ended up staying. One stayed a night and another one just left this afternoon. Uh, and then we had the 4th of July in the U.S. Uh, yesterday and a, you know, a get-together and fireworks with the kids. And so um, I'm kind of uh, with Jeffrey in that uh, I'm reading this to, as an introduction to, to Aurobindo. I, I also want to see what he's, where he's going, and I want to weave it in to my life, but uh, I'm not subsuming my whole life to you know, reading this book in depth at this time. Uh, I want to have a sense for, where, for what he means by core terms like mind or life or matter or supermind. Uh, and to give myself the space to absorb that and ponder on it and um, practice with it. Uh, so uh, I hope that's okay. That, that's, that's just my approach. And I appreciate having these meetings because they, I think without them, I'm well, I, I would still want to read this, and I would still have an incentive inherently, I think, in the text to read this, but I find it valuable to um, to hear what other people think and how other people are experiencing the text, even if it's not the complete experience, even if it's not. I'm very interested in personal s stories and contexts and really what this means for, for us, for you. Uh, as abstract philosophy, it's it's fun, but I'm I'm very interested. What more moves me is uh, is how um, how it could change my experience of life. So that said, shall we meditate for a few minutes? And then after that, um, we can leave it open to what wants to arise.
I appreciate the experiment of seeing how this affects our lives. wanted to say uh, just a quick comment. Um, I was watching the episode last week, which, I mean, the video chat from the seance last week, uh, which I didn't as attend. But I found that the video, there was a strong sense of presence that I felt. And uh, Doug sometimes talks about uh, the relationship between uh, the stuff that we do here and Quaker meeting. And I found it had a very much a feeling of Quaker meeting, a, this kind of uh, presence in the background and then people stepping forward with uh, some pithy comment to make and then stepping back. It had very much that, uh, I found it very powerful to listen to the experience. Cool. This friend speaks my mind. I'm just noticing now that the experience of being here with you guys and gals, um, I'm, I'm particularly curious what Jeffrey and Derwin think because they're most active on the, on the forum. I know Mark Lee said you read it. Um, it feels just profoundly different. It feels like here we're present together. And it feels like it's really hard to get away from a linear feeling, watching the page, you know, go down. That's the thought. I know you opened the inquiry to those who are actively involved in the forum, but I've, I often want to speak for uh, those who actively don't involve in the forum or who bounce off of the forum. And I've seen this in, uh, in various Oro forums, like Don knows Oro Conf. What, what I find is there's a, in, in forums, there's a mental discourse that as the thread progresses, people grab things from what people say and run in different directions. And it's, it's what I call it, it's what I call ping pong monologue. So there's not really an opportunity to get whole bodied biofeedback yet in conversation, some of the nastiness, and I don't know what's going on in the infinite conversations forum because I'm just simply not tracking it, but I'm speaking to other forums. Some of the nastiness that I see would never take place if we were sitting down and having a conversation ever, ever, because we actually love and respect each other and want to integrate each other's ideas rather than uh, debate and argue for the most part. I believe Terry had worked with his fellow Greg Kramer who spent years developing Insight Dialogue. He had an experiment Jen and I were part of about 15 years ago we'd be in a chat session with about eight people around the world at the same time. We would practice writing while meditating. It was a really interesting experience. Well, there are a number of, of those kind of intersubjective um, practices out there these days. Um, and I guess one thing that's sort of interesting is that's not so much in Aurobindo that I'm seeing. Um, but I'm not, maybe not that far yet um, into it where he gets into that part. I mean, he talks about social development, right? But I'm wondering what Aurobindo would say about the intersubjective kind of I, thou kind of thing. You'll find some 8,000 letters about that. It's in the letters. <laughs> okay. I don't think Sri Aurobindo's completeness can be judged off the life divine. It's, uh, 
Yeah, there's a lot of intersubjectivity. There's Oroville. <laughs> Good point. Yeah, the world, the world's only not-for-profit international township. That's the, the world's only not-for-profit international township. It's a special thing. Also, um, she had been a sort of consciously gave the responsibility for all the intersubjective stuff to the mother. So if you look at her 17 volumes of live conversations, it's all about that. I'm just chuckling because I could spend the rest of my life reading <laughs> 8,000 yeah. letters. <laughs> yeah, and the 13 volumes, uh, I think six of which are questions and answers. So much has to do with harmony with others and working in groups. And Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's been, a, it's been a, I have very little experience with Ken Wilber, but it's been really unfortunate to hear that criticism of Sri Aurobindo, unfortunate to where it makes me laugh a little bit because it's just a, a, an incomplete understanding. There's a, a lot of intersubjectivity, but maybe, I've, maybe I'm taking Ken Wilber out of context because I've only read five of his books twice and that was it. Just, just so Derwin's concern doesn't get lost, I would say I've heard upwards of 90% of the Oroville residents have never read any Sri Aurobindo. Of the 10,000 member community around the world, very, very few of them have read any of his books straight through. Most people get these little compilations, like 60 pages, mostly from the letters, which are very, no one reads the philosophy. They don't care about the fancy stuff. The, the letters where he writes conversations and says, what, you said this? What are you crazy? Or, you know. So, yeah, don't worry about all those 85 million volumes. And sense of humor galore. <laughs> like laugh out loud sense of humor. He is hilarious. <laughs> so is she, too. Careful, Mateo. You're going to let him know we're in a cult, so be quiet about that. <laughs> Well, I, I think it's um, it's good to point out the differences between this "quote unquote" real time in person communication and the uh, asynchronous uh, text based uh, communication on the forum. They're clearly different media that enable different kinds of uh, of communication. Like, there's a way that here I have to say what I think right away as I'm thinking it uh, on the forum. I can think about it and then rework it and reconsider it and read what somebody else has said, reread it. Uh, I can't re-listen to something that somebody else has said here on the, in this space until after the fact. And then I, can't, I don't have the opportunity to, to respond to it in the moment. So um, I, I'm curious what it would be like and what it would mean um, to approach writing or text-based interaction with, from a meditative uh, kind of state of mind uh, so that we're bringing that, that presence to the act of reading and then replying to uh, a, a forum topic uh, and, and then you know, re receiving the response in that state of receptive kind of presence as well. How would that change the nature of dis the discourse and what's even up for discourse. Um, I don't know exactly. I mean, I think that's a potentiality. It's something that we could experiment with. If I might respond to your uh, question, Don, following the different interventions. Um, so, uh, um, for instance, uh, I was, uh, well, anyway, it's a complicated story, but I dived into Gebser on the weekend. Uh, so I read the first hundred pages of Ever Present Origin. And I also reviewed, I think, the first four of the recordings of the video chats around Gebser's work. Uh, and they have, yeah, there's a lot of discussion, but they have some of the same reflectiveness that we have here. Uh, it's perhaps a little bit more intellectual than it is here, but 
the work we're doing on the minor gesture also has a lot of contemplative elements to the way the dialogue works. So it it varies, I think, in each uh, in each context and in each what what emerges from the group is in somehow reflects the work that one is looking at. So uh, the discussion we did on Soul Mountain was uh, on a novel, not Soul Mountain, was again very different, but not poppy poppy intellectual at all. It was actually quite emotional. Um, and um, we also have a writer's group and the writer's group, its interactions are also very meditative. Um, so I don't think it's, I think this group is interesting and it's, there's something interesting about the dynamics here. Um, but I don't think it's unique exactly in kind from the other conversations that are going on in, on the site. Um, it's just a variation because the text is different and lends itself to that kind of approach. Anyway, that would be my response uh, to the question. And I guess I just have one response um, to Marco around the idea of the meditative, like I like that idea. And I'm just curious, how can you tell from reading somebody whether they're in a meditative, whether they're in a state of presence when they've written that, their response or not. And I don't know the answer. I'm just, I'm, that would be the inquiry, you know. Because, um, yeah, certainly the cognition's different in a state of presence and not in a state of presence. So but I'm not sure how we would see that in language. I know uh, I'm not on Facebook anymore, but when I was, it was pretty obvious who was coming from a place of non-presence <laughs> and who wasn't um, about a meditative space. I don't know. That's a whole different thing. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know exactly how you would define that. Um, is there, um, I know I haven't been active on the, the conversations in that forum. Um, is there a way to reply directly to one person's comment? Yeah, okay. Well, then that feels like it's pretty not able to be concise or not concise to, to be able to work with everyone's ideas and not get lost too easily. I know I've been reading a little bit. I just haven't posted anything. I think text is interesting because particularly in this space, uh, because it's a literary, potentially a literary format. So something could be read or written in ways that are not linear necessarily uh, and that are not even meant to be interpreted uh, only on one level. Uh, so I think that part of what is interesting to me and why I read the, the forum, and sometimes I don't have time to formulate a response to things or I have other things going on. And, um, I don't like to, I don't like to reply in haste. I like to, uh, have absorbed and reflected on a bit. Um, sometimes there's, you know, an impulsive kind of immediacy to a reply, but, uh, and sometimes it's just transactional and, um, um, uh, you know, m m not, not as requiring as, as thought. But I think particularly in this group, there are people coming from different perspectives uh, and different backgrounds and who are reading in different ways and who also write in, in different ways. And I mean, one thing that I, I've tried to cultivate in myself is reading others. So we read Aurobindo and we read Gao Jingjiang or we 
who is the author of uh, Soul Mountain uh, or any other author, and they're, they're never with us. We don't get to talk to them. Uh, so we have to read and interpret uh, according to our own devices and, and amongst ourselves. But what's nice about reading each other is that we get to talk to each other too. And so we can refine, I think, our interpretations and our mutual understanding. And at the end of the day, I don't really care what Aurobindo thinks or, or anybody else. Uh, I'm, I, 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 there's something that's deeper than uh, the mental uh, discourse, you know, whether it happens in real time or in uh, you know, forum time. And I, I, I want to keep my heart open to that, to that matter, so to speak. Uh, like, what is the heart of the matter here? Why, why are we doing this? Uh, the, I think that, I mean, part of what has come through in these conversations and, and also in the forum is um, maybe a circling around things and a seeing things from different sides. And um, I, I, I'm, I'm just to give an example. I read the, the uh, whole thread on, on matter and I participated in parts of it, but I, I haven't yet fully been able to reply to it and it's really got me kind of it puts me in a state of looking at thing, the things around me the physical world quote-unquote physical world in a different way I'm so I'm questioning it I'm I'm feeling what it would feel like if what I felt were matter were not merely matter and then I listened to the chapter uh, on matter chapter 24 uh, I listened to it, and so I haven't yet done a reread or a more careful read, but I'm getting more of a, a sense that and that f matter is real, but it's a reality that is held within another reality. It's a, ma a, it's a reality that's an expression of or that's a vehicle for another reality. And so then what's that other reality? What, if not explains matter, um, sustains it. I think that's that honing in on what Aurobindo seems to be really moving towards. What's that kind of strange attractor in the middle of the text? Is for me the what what sustains my attention, what sustains my interest. But I think it also the question of matter gets to the heart of the matter because. Uh, it gets to what is that, um, what's that ultimate reality at the core of things. Uh, so Ed is an, um, I'd say a, a, a critic of the materialist view. Now we're talking like in mental categories that at the heart of matter is something non-conscious, non-intelligent, non-divine. He wants he wants to hold open the possibility that there's something more than that. And certainly I think Aurobindo has something much more than that, much more than that at the heart of matter. And so, you know, this gets to, I think the relationship between science and spirituality or re religion and spirit, like of this fundamentally different view, view of what's really of ultimate, um, ultimate substance, I'm kind of failing with, with the words for it, but Aurobindo is quite eloquent uh, and he's laying these concepts out. So I'm, I'm curious, what is at the heart of, uh, of the matter, right? We're not just, if it's just material things, then who cares? If it's illusion, then who cares? That's kind of what Aurobindo is saying. We have to take it seriously. It has to be real for it to matter. And, and then, you know, this is why the literary and the metaphorical are so important because matter is this word. And I've just used it in multiple different senses. One kind of to refer to the scientific definition of matter, another to refer to the sort of uh, um, human aspect of matter. Uh, matter etymologically is related to mother, right? So, so there's this kind of backdoor tie-in back to the metaphysics. Um, and uh, and the earth, uh, as you know, for primal humanity, the the you know the matter of 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 
of reality. So um, those are just some reflections uh, based on my meditations with, with this, uh, my very in, uh, incomplete, I'll, sh- I'll say, meditations uh, on, on this matter. So Marco had said something earlier about the experiential. How does it relate to our life? And I wanted to share something about that related to matter. I had on the forum, I had quoted a line where Shirbino says, in a certain sense, matter is unreal and non-realistic. And Jeffrey very aptly pointed out that Shirbino said, in a certain sense, which is really, really good, is a good qualifier. So I find often when I'm reading that chapter or reflecting on what matter is and what more it could be, is it makes me think of the experience of false awakenings. I'm not sure if any folks have ever worked with lucid dreams, you know, developing the ability to be aware when you're dreaming. And I find myself and many people say when they first start doing it, you have these false awakenings. So you'll, you'll wake up in your bed and say, oh, what an interesting dream. And you get up and you hit your alarm clock. And you, get up, you know, you go through this whole thing, you get to the, you get to the kitchen and you see, I don't want orange juice today. I'd like, uh, you know, something else, a little monster appears at your table. You go, oh, I thought I was awake. I'm really dreaming. Okay, so it's a false awakening. That's number one. You go back to bed, blah, blah, blah. You get up, you go to the bathroom, and suddenly you look like, I don't know, you know, Paul Newman. You think, wait, I don't look like Paul Newman, you know. I got hair, too. What's going on? So false awakening. You go through about three of that, and you start getting a little bit nervous, right? So it's about the third time you go like, okay, I'm awake, but am I awake? I've had like four or five of those. And it can start getting really scary the fifth time you realize I've tested, I've jumped up and down, I've, I've hit the bed, I've scratched myself. It feels totally real. And I have no idea if this is waking matter or dream matter. You know, I even, Stephen LeBerge said that one way you can tell is you, you, if you read a book when you're dreaming, you can't read more in the language. It gets wavy. I remember one dream I had, a lucid dream. I, I said, let me get LeBerge's book. And I started reading it. I read like two pages. I said, I can't wait to tell LeBerge. I can read the book. So is this a dream or not? So I strongly recommend playing around with inducing false awakenings after reading this chapter. You'll get a whole different sense of matter. So I have two short uh, uh, readings from Aurobindo that I'd like to do. Um, They're just both passages that affected me. So the one is the one I mentioned for the chapter called um, The Knot of Matter. Um, So liberating ourselves from all passion and revolt, let us see what this divine order of the universe means and As for this great knot and tangle of matter denying the spirit, let us seek to find out and separate its strands so as to loosen it by a solution and not cut through it by a violence. Um, So it's just the first mention of the knot in the chapter. um, And then the rest of it goes into sort of untangling these different strands. Um, but I found it such an interesting, this idea of a knot in the world of matter that links the way the mind is embedded in matter to be really interesting. And the other quote is an earlier quote. Uh, um, I can't remember which chapter it's from now, uh, but I think it's one of the ones before. To find the conditions under which this inner impulsion is satisfied is the problem man must always strive to resolve. And to that he is compelled by the very nature of his own existence and by the deity seated within him. And until the problem is solved, the impulse satisfied, the human race cannot rest from its labor. So it's this idea that the great labor of humanity is because we have this hidden deity inside that is trying to reassert itself. Uh, so it, it relates to the knot 
in another way. Um, and I thought, I think this is brilliant. I really do. I think this whole idea is, is, is I don't know if it's central to Aurobindo, but it's, it seems something I can hang my hat on, something that speaks to me very deeply. One thing that affected me the most in the current reading was in the ascent of life when he starts transitioning from matter to life breaking down in matter to stabilize itself. And I was like walking my dogs and I felt like I had had a low dose of in entheogens or something. I was seeing everything combining and moving around and interconnected. And uh, then the most obvious is the sexual reproduction, having cells become haploid cells and recombining with other haploid cells to form other beings it I don't know it just really touched me I it, it was one of the probably the, the the one that jumped out at me the most as I was not reading the text and just walking around in in life It also dawned on me that it's where it is building to with all the talk of matter and life is the thing that is, I think, truly unique about Sri Aurobindo and the Mother's Yoga. And that I don't, I don't think that there's any other place on earth where two people have come together to, with the aspiration of divinizing matter. That's like Debashish, I heard him say it's like the, the largest hubris any two people could attempt, which if, if it's at all even possible, if we're to even think that it's possible, makes that, that move avataric. And I know that that came up on the, the forum, so I was thinking about it and reflecting on that. Uh, maybe you all that, that study philosophy and perennial philosophy more than I do know of, know of some other tradition or, I don't know, system that has done that. But I'm, I'm fairly certain that Sri Aurobindo was, and the mother were the first to attempt to bring, the, to bring that consciousness into their vessel with that objective to flip the universe on its on its head to make matter divine not just inconscient or half conscious but fully awake that might be the the core of uh the core of the reading here that's not quite explicit yet Um, I think in Tibetan Buddhism, there's this um, attempt at something called the rainbow body. Uh, I don't know in the timeline when that came into Tibetan Buddhism, but it seems like it's a pretty similar uh, kind of notion of the divinization of, of the body of matter. Um, 
think uh, where I've read that is being from Alan Wallace. Um, you know, the Tibetan Buddhists are also pretty remarkable bunch of people. Oh. Billy, could, could uh, someone say a little bit more about uh, just what that means to divinize matter or the divinization of matter? What, would that, what form would that take or what would that look like? Or what would that be? I, I'm just going to throw out a little shocker that Mateo, correct me if I'm saying this wrong, but they were of the view that what they were doing was going to affect the entire universe, physical, subtle, and causal. So it wasn't just a matter of their bodies, which the rainbow body is about the body, but they were of the opinion, which I rarely say to people outside, <laughs> outside the integral yoga. But if you ever read anything they, they, they wrote that made them seem totally irredeemably wacko, yeah, no, they were saying this was going to affect the entire universe and all possible universes. Yeah, I mean, I think that's good to be open and honest about, Don. It's, uh, it's, it's in chapter one of this where he challenges us to aspire to the highest and to not have fear of that. And that's actually what they're referring to. He's talking about developing or new organs to, uh, as our ranges of consciousness open, the body will form new organs. And, uh, but to address Frederick a little bit more succinctly, um, I don't think it's possible for, a, that they made a lot of analogies about the, the arcs of evolution and one of the analog one of the great analogies that I can at least understand is the the difference between the the human saying what would it look like to divinize matter is even a further jump than the ape saying what would it be like to have abstract thought so that the that leap in consciousness from uh being an ape to be able to compose. Bach and calculus and such, uh, the leap from human to super, what they call Superman in, in, in living in, with supermental consciousness, the leap is so great that it would be impossible for us to have discourse around that. What, what is, seems to me also pretty unique about the path of integral yoga is that the aspiration is there to collaborate with the soul in collaboration with the divine consciousness to be part of that, to be an active participant in that process. And that's something that no animal could even conceive of doing. Yet here we are actually considering it. There's a lot of people around the globe outside of integral yoga circles that are tuned into this also that know we can open up our ranges of consciousness and widen from there, even, uh, yeah, universalize our consciousness. Um, Maybe I could ask, uh, is it possible in, in any of this? Uh, oh, sorry? Is there any way in which one can, um, if, if not conceptualize, at least gesture towards or metaphorically um, picture, uh, say, the attributes of divinity, whatever they may be? Um, uh, or is this a complete mystery uh, forever beyond the ability of our present level of cognition to grasp? Because if it were possible to say something about what the features that something has to have in order to be, in order to count as divine, then one could look at our present conception of matter and identify the features something has to have in order to count as matter and uh, see whether any of them are divine or add the divine features to that. And then we have some kind of concept of what matter divinized would be. Uh, now it may not be a very, it would be a very crude concept and would be merely, merely analytical, 
and it would only be the best that uh, creatures with our you know poor level of cognition could achieve. But if 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 something if it even a, an approximation to that could be achieved, I think it would be something. I mean, it would at least help somebody like me get some kind of answer. Jaya, is there a paragraph in the Notebook of Evolution I, that? I think that it, it we can look at sort of maybe what Gebser says and how our language is going to have to evolve as well, that I don't think currently we really even have the right language to speak about it. Um, I like how Gebser talks about speaking with fruition and truth and well, of course, like, what's that going to look like too? It's, um, to me, I see the divinity in the world through synchronicities, through the intelligence in nature, um, and through having, um, just totally blissful experiences. Um, one of those ways for me is like through dance. And it reminds me of like, we were saying with Teo about how you're experiencing this feeling, um, on your walk. Uh, I went to a bunch of concerts this last week and just had such high spiritual experiences and, um, I always think of this line um, from a Grateful Dead song where they say, wake up to find out that you are the eyes of the world. And that's kind of the sense that I get, the, the synchronicities of it all and how we're, our, our free will is like part of the will of the greater divinity of it all. And every choice we make, every place we're in is like just exactly perfect we were we were searching for free tickets for all the shows, and we managed to find free tickets to all of them, but uh, two. And it's just what you what you put out there, like you can get back, and it's this that you can see the divinity in in that, in this like cosmic dance that we're playing in each and every moment in our lives. Well, I th- I, I I resonate with that. When I try to imagine what divinized matter is, my first thought is human beings. Uh, because uh, when I relate to another human being, I, I know on some level they are matter, you know, they have brains and eyes and muscle and uh, all of this. But I, I, can't, I know that that's not who that person is. There's something in me that's not that, and there's something in them that's not that. And I can't conceive of it really. Um, I can't understand it very well, Um, but I have, you know, an absolute conviction that this is real. Um, So uh, that's one model maybe for divinized reality. It gets back to what I think we were just talking about earlier, this notion of intersubjectivity. Part of being a person is understanding oneself to be understood as a person by another person. That's the I-thou relationship. Uh, So, yeah, I guess, you know, if we're looking for an example of the divinization of matter, we got it right here. It's right here. And I would say, I would really explain anything, <laughs> you know, um, but it just, it identifies something. Anyway. Beautiful, Frederick and Lauren. Yeah, it's, it's, we, we're transitional beings. And I think all of us have a sense right now in 2018 that we're transitioning and that there's a gap in, uh, consciousness sensitivity among humanity right now. One, one of Sri Aurobindo, no, Sri, not one of, but Sri Aurobindo's last prose writing, he uh, uh, was asked to write, I think there's about seven articles compiled under the title, The Supermental Manifestation Upon Earth. He wrote them in 1950. And it's all about the mind of light and the transitional beings on the way. There's like, uh, it's it's packed with exactly what you, Frederick and Lauren, kind of just beautifully described in in poetry. I appreciate that. I hate to go or anything, but um, I think yeah. being the top of the hour maybe is a good time. Uh, I have to get it going. Thank you all. Bye. Thank um, you. Thanks next week. Bye. Bye. Um, 
about what Derwin had asked before. I think I think Derwin had asked about, and Fred also about descriptions. Um, if you don't want to go through the thirteen volumes of Mother's Agenda, that's besides the seventeen volumes of her collected works. Um, some people, it's online also. It's called the Notebook of Evolution. It's about hundred pages. It's probably some of the best excerpts of what she was doing the last thirteen years of her life as her body was transforming. She describes being everywhere, and she's and again, Matteo. Correct me if I'm not saying this. If I'm not saying it well. She's very careful to repeat over and she doesn't mean this in the non-dual sense that her awareness, that she means her body, her matter was everywhere. So she would describe noticing certain things happening in her leg. And she would say, oh, that's, that's, that's what's happening in Pakistan. A certain skirmish is happening. And she, she would describe it. And then later they check and it was happening just as she was describing it. She described things happening all over the world. And, since I don't want to focus only on Mother and Tree of Minnow, it brought to mind this sense of being in different places. I had a piano teacher who studied with a woman named Abby Whiteside. And she also studied sensory awareness with Charlotte Selver, who was at Esalen for many years. And one year she was invited to speak both in New York at the Abby Whiteside gathering and in London at the Charlotte Selver gathering. And she really, really wanted to be at both. And she finally chose to go to London. And she was thinking about the Abby Whiteside talk in New York the whole time. So she got back and she couldn't wait to ask her friend, well, how was this, the Abby Whiteside thing in New York? And she said, oh, we just, we loved your talk. You were wonderful. And everyone who attended the Abby Whiteside talk in New York, while she was talking in London, had seen her give a talk in New York. And this kind of stuff happened to Sophia a lot. So, you know, people in the integral yoga community would say, you know, the supermental force is like, you know, having an effect on the universe. And these kind of things are happening more. So, for what it's worth. I have a follow-up question, maybe to Fred's, and it would be that um, what what defines divine, right? Because let's say we have an atom, it's Aurobindo in the chapter on matter talks about atoms and their kind of divisibility, divisi infinite divisibility. I mean, no, that's not true from the physical per science perspective necessarily, but an atom... W what, what's the difference between a regular atom and a divine atom would be one way of putting it. Now, what I think I'm hearing and what I got from Lauren was that it's not the, that the atom itself is any different. Atom is an atom is, is an atom, but that its organization, its place in a life, in a, a, a mental awareness, and ultimately in a supramental awareness or truth consciousness uh, is what divinizes it. So it's through the participation in a higher intelligence. And that what the supermind is doing through its involutionary process is, uh, you know, sometimes it comes across as very kind of top down. Um, but pressing into service, for lack of a better word, the mind, which presses into service life, which presses into service matter in order to manifest this divinity. Uh, I think that that is probably a crude interpretation, but it's, it's where I'm getting in the understanding of what we mean by divinizing matter. It, it means that the supramental is um, incorporating matter into its being and becoming, into its unfolding play through time time is the other aspect that i think is interesting about this because if matter were to be divinized my question from a potentially a skeptic's perspective is why hasn't it happened already or is it not already the case I think. Well, you, you know, as i listen to you it, um I'm sort of translating what, you, what I take you to be saying into just some language that's a little bit more familiar to me. I don't know if it's else. 
But there is a position in philosophy called perspectival dualism. Uh, so, you know, if you accept some version of Kant's argument, of course, matter is uh, the form in which uh, that which is appears to us. Um, and uh, it doesn't necessarily reflect the way things are in themselves, uh, which is by definition beyond our cognition. Uh, uh, our cognition has to do with the way things show up to us. Um, so you could also think of that linguistically uh, as uh, being in possession of different descriptive vocabularies that describe the world in different ways for different purposes. So uh, we deal with lots of aspects of physical reality uh, by thinking about them and describing them and trying to manipulate them uh, from a sort of third person perspective. We think of them as just stuff meaningless little bits of stuff that interact in various ways in accordance with, you know, the uniform causal laws that we try to work out for them. Um, but we describe human beings, for example, persons in completely different ways. We have a first person view of them. We think of them as subjects with a kind of interior experience. They're centers of agency and choice and will and so on and so forth. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, one way of maybe thinking about this is instead of thinking about the divinization process as some sort of magical, supernatural uh, thing that is beyond our comprehension, as if it's some kind of entity doing something, right? Uh, we could think of it as just the evolution of human uh, linguistic discipline, which, of course, are expressed in the ways in which we talk to one another and talk about things, conceive of one another as subjects that have to be respected and persuaded rather than manipulated and coerced and so on. Um, I don't know, what do you think of that? That's a kind of um, uh, attempt to, I guess, uh, sort of demystify the notion of the supermind, perhaps. Yeah. In fact, I'll just say quickly, um, Fred, you've just, I think, articulated beautifully uh, almost century-old critique of Sri Aurobindo, it's actually very prominent among Indian philosophers and also Western that um, the most the most passionate negative one I've heard from a his name is Nasser N A N A S R he's a Persian um, Sufi one of the perennial philosophers that Sri Aurobindo had articulated an extremely naive materialistic sort of supernatural magical view mm -hmm. and that what the what the Vedantas had always talked about was this shift of consciousness and not at all what you know, what he did, what he said was just Nasser referred to it as the the ultimate limit of the darkness of the Kali Yuga that someone like Sri Aurobindo would come along who so completely misunderstood all of Indian spirituality. Well, that's interesting. <laughs> So, so I, um, I didn't understand, I mean, I'm listening to the discussion about this idea of, div like Matthew brought up this idea of the divination of matter as a, and Marco, you interpreted it as a process in the process of happening. Whereas when I heard Matthew talk about that, I thought he was sort of saying, well, matter is divine. So that what Aurobindo and uh, the mother were doing were, in a sense, pointing out that matter is divine to begin with and not uh, separate from the divine, if you like. Um, I mean, and, and certainly he talks about, you know, the fact that uh, the body is tends, in many re religions, tends to be neglected or even reviled and that, this approach embraces the body. So um, I, I do understand that there might also be a progression because obviously that ties into the evolutionary aspect of his <clears throat> writing, which I don't fully understand at this point. Um, what I did want to say though is that, so I don't want to, uh, people tend to romanticize quantum theory and they tend to pick on particular aspects of quantum theory. So, for instance, people will talk about entanglement as being an example of how things that 
isn't locations are interconnected, but it's a it's a kind of a it's a kind of a it's a thought experiment that leads it. I mean, there are experimental measurements, and it is, but it's not as simple as it as it looks the way people talk about it. It's not as simple as that, uh, and. And the idea the observer is involved in experiments, well, that's not simple either. There's no clear way that there's kind of an implicit observer, but it's it's not even clear that it's a human engagement there. So th these issues, I think, are, are often picked as being characteristic of a more humanistic approach that quantum physics gives. I don't think that's where the divine, I think that the, quantum physics approach gives us a way to view matter as being more divine than we tend to do so. But I think it has to do with the basic structure of quantum physics. The idea that all objects, all atoms, we were talking about atoms earlier, are waves. They're not just atomic particles, they're also waves. And the waves extend from one end of the universe to the other. They are not local waves, they are global waves. And we are all made up of a large number of these atoms, each of which has its own wave function that propagates from one end of the universe to the other. Um, now, it's true that the way these wave functions work is they tend to peak, and they peak sharply. So they peak in a close way around the body. But people assume that there's no wave beyond the body. But there is. It's just, it's just, it, it's just very weak. But there is one, and it goes out to the edge of infinity. And so, in a way, all of us intermingle all the time. Our wave functions are constantly interacting with each other in different ways. So, is that not a property of a divine? I mean, uh, Fred, you were talking about properties of the divine is not the interpenetration of all matter an example of a divine property? I mean, to me, that is, it's just a way of thinking about these things. And although, you know, there's a lot more work to be done in quantum mechanics and quantum theory or, or quantum gravity or whatever, the basics are already there. Beautiful. <laughs> I don't know exactly how to respond to all this right now, but I have quite a bit of thoughts roaming around and I'm hoping to tie in everything that everybody's said, at least here recently about the divinization of matter. And I view Aurobindo's cosmology as a cycle, perhaps some sort of lopsided cycle maybe, but so there's Brahman. That's everything, infinity. Add anything else you'd like to say about it, it's that too. And then comes in matter or the first thought or this or that. And then we're, we're some sort of point on the upswing of the, this, this um, evolution. Um, we, we're kind of tied in between both sides, and maybe the supermind is what is able to divinize matter. But from once once matter is sort of released from Brahman, from Satchit Ananda, as, as it's phrased. And please correct me if I'm wrong at any point or add any of the real Aurobindo thoughts here, but. I, I almost see matter as having its own duration. Um, Bergson, Henri Bergson, gave us the notion of duration. Um, like we're, when we're thinking about something or talking about something or in this moment, we're not just fully present. We're also part of all of the accumulation of 
our past and perhaps even thoughts into the future. Um, but each atom or smaller whatever or each wave is something that has its own duration from the moment it came into existence. However that happened, we can't fathom. Uh, we can think about it quite a bit, but as uh, maybe this goes back to what the mother was talking about, how Pakistan is tickling her left pinky toe or something like that. Um, that this, this element, this very fine point of whatever has been ex in existence for quite a long time. And we might have one element of that within us, or it might be some force that's all out there. And this goes back to we are all or we are one um, type of mentality, but it, it's it's hard to grasp. And I um, had so much more to say about that, but um, please jump in here, fill in my gaps in thought. <laughs> It's incredibly difficult for me to grasp too, Doug. I th thought everything that you said is really beautiful and on point. And yeah, this, this stuff is uh, the, the aspirate, the core aspiration is like so perplexing that it's, it's the, I, I don't even know. I, I don't even know how to put this. It's like the, the most perplexing thing that I could attempt in this life. So I'm like, let's go for it. I don't, I, but I don't, I don't know that I have any, after 15 years with it, I don't think I have any better grasp than anyone on this forum right now. It's, uh, uh, we're kind of, I kind of see us as all in this together. There's, um, yeah, yeah, this, this stuff is incredibly difficult and, uh, kind of back to, uh, that, that point of if su the, the criticism of super mind, exists why hasn't it manifested already it would be the the kind of the, the counter to that that Sri Aurobindo makes a lot is what would would life be able to say that about mind uh, are there higher states than, are there higher accesses to consciousness than infinity even I you know I I don't know these uh these things are incredibly difficult to approach fun to approach but um uh, and and then back to a comment that Jeffrey, that everybody I think is making as part of this is is finite, the finite becoming infinite, the the indeterminable becoming determinable. You know what what happens when we as finite beings start approaching infinite conversations? <laughs> I, I have to get going. I just thought I'd leave you with two thoughts. Um, as far as what divinization of matter means, there is a passage in Sri Aurobindo where he describes one possibility of the future, supermental body, where the organs like the heart and lungs and intestines and so on are replaced by the chakras, the energy center. So that's very concrete, just a thought. And my favorite answer to why, you know, like why hasn't the supermind come forward, or you know, like why is there evil in the world? Um, Ramakrishna, when asked about why there was evil, said, to thicken the plot. Okay. That's as good as an answer as any. So with that, I bid you adieu. Um, on this theme of, uh, of um, uh, everyone being connected as part of the big uh, wave formations and the particles, of course, even if you want to think of them as particles that we're ultimately made up of, um, of course, have existed for billions and billions of years and have been, before they were part of us, they were part of many, many, many countless other objects in infinite space and infinite time. And there's a passage in Shakespeare that uh, sort of gets at this. I thought I would just put on the table. Uh, so this is from uh, Hamlet. He says, uh, imperious Caesar, dead and turned to clay, might stop a hole to keep the wind away. Oh, that the earth which kept the world in awe should patch a wall to expel the winter's flaw. And uh, he also says to King Claudius, a man may fish with the worm that has eat of a king and eat of the fish that has fed of that worm. So 
just to prove that Shakespeare knew everything too. Well, just from a technical perspective, I, I think that we would need to distinguish between the primordial divinity of man, matter, if you will, and the processual div divinization, divinity of matter that comes about through a process, because the word divinization implies a process. Uh, and what I think I'm hearing in some of what Matteo are sharing and um, Don, this kind of occult, you know, knowledge or occult project is uh, that part of what Aurobindo was initiating uh, and what uh, presumably the community, Auroville, and then the global community are carrying out in some way is the process of the, div of the divinization of matter. I wonder if I understand that correctly, because that is radical. That's a truly radical proposition. Uh, and I wonder how seriously <laughs> uh, you take it. Like, um, I, I mean, it's a, right? because it's, you know, you, you are almost speak of it in hushed terms. Like, should we let the, uh, you know, the others know how crazy we are? Um, and I want to know how crazy you are. That was Don, that wasn't me. Well, yeah, I don't think I can judge sanity against myself, first of all, <laughs> but uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't know how to answer that, Marco. <laughs> I'm on board. I think it's a great idea, actually, but I mean, the, you know, the devil is in the details, right? Um, and I feel like I mean, perhaps what we're doing in so far as we're on this path uh, is, are we divinizing matter now? I mean, is this uh, part of the, like this part of how it's done? Um, I mean, wouldn't that, because that would be the process, right? Like that would be the practice or the yoga. Ultimately, the goal of it would be to like, well, uh, this would come through, of course, through the, through the learning, but um, to effectuate this transformation, right? Um, I mean, that's part of what I understand or what I think draws me to Aurobindo is that it seems to have a world historical kind of implications, but it's, it's so not the, part of the political and just uh, conventional, let's say, discourse about how change happens or what would change mean? What would progress mean? This is a much, well, it's a much, um, the word revolutionary has, has come about. I mean, I don't want to romanticize it. Um, but that's the sense I get, that there's the, that sort of sense that we're working towards something that would be uh, perhaps manifest in certain forms. Like, would we see a planetary kind of civilization that, you know, had a different kind of social organization? Would we relate to technology in different ways? Would we have different kinds of social and cultural institutions? Um, would we also have kind of educational systems that trained our awareness on sensing some of the kinds of things that Jeffrey's talking about, this way that all of our atoms uh, you know, have this kind of local uh, peak, but then extend out into infinity? Could we sense that through training? But would that training really require sort of mass mobilization, right? Just as we needed to mobilize all of the resources of technological society to split the atom, would we need to do something similar um, in, in the internal dimensions to divinize matter in this sense that Aurobindo might be pointing to? Like, I'm excited by the prospect, but I, 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 uh, I just, I, I would beg you to, um, you know, to, to try us, <laughs> you know, it, it, what do you have in mind? Uh, like what, what could, what would be the kind of the big things that are even on the horizon, you know, achievable on the way toward this, um, this transformation, uh, if that's what's on the, on the agenda. Um, without having a clear answer to that, um, 
it seems to me the question of whether or not a group of people on the earth could affect things at the level of the universe. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> some of my books deal with that. <laughs> but um, right. the issue would seem to me, are we alone in the universe? So is the earth the only life in the universe? Because if, if we are the only life in the universe, which would seem to me naively and absurd, uh, but we don't know one way or the other, uh, then clearly what happens to this group matters for everything else. But if we are one among hundreds of billions of other conscious beings across the infinite seas of the cosmos, uh, what we do as a group is probably not all that important in the grand, grand scheme of things. So uh, I th think it has a kind of relativism to it as a question. Mm -hmm. Well, one, one thing I just add, uh, thanks Jeff, is um, I I'm going in a slightly different way, but just to say something about what comes up for me would be related to subtle energy kinds of experiences or uh, vibrational healing um, or the transmission experience, the experience of presence, basically. Like, um, so for example, not every time, but sometimes, well, I'd, I'll give you an example. So now you can see how crazy I am. But I have a friend um, who's the son of the founder of the spiritual community that I grew up in, who's been doing um, subtle energy healing work for like 50 years now, like a long, long time. And he does treatments with me. He's in Florida. But I fancy that when we start at the designated time that I can pick up that current almost right away, um, most times when he starts doing that. And it has a particular quality or feeling that I've come to associate with him when he does that. And it's a different quality or feeling than, uh, say, Muji or even Terry O'Fallon, I feel, has a transmission quality that comes through when I put all my attention on her and when she's speaking. Um, I have no idea how all that might work is it related to different kind of karmic factors uh, you know this is the person that i need to be orienting to right now because there's some karmic thing that's being worked out between us um i don't know but that's the closest thing to this sort of parapsychological vein as i'm thinking that that we're on um that resonates with my experience um and the community I grew up in did this, had a practice like this, kind of like a Reiki attunement. It was a, you know, a process of conducting energy or attention, intention for the purposes of healing, or you might say divinization of, of the body in this case. You know, I don't think anybody was trying to do it on matter. Um, but it was used and... Um, Gosh, you know, I, I, I literally would have had like a thousand of these treatments growing up because it was just part of the culture that I grew up in. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to say something and throw that out there. You guys. Um, with, with regard to the, uh, what I understand anyway, to be the sort of political vision that's behind this, this notion that we may be progressing uh, or evolving towards a world of, of harmony, complete harmony and unity and togetherness and so on. I, I don't mean to sound dismissive, but um, uh, personally, when I hear talk like that, my first impulse is to want to run as fast as possible in the other direction. I, I, um, I don't think such a society would be desirable. Um, uh, you know, I, and I don't think most people who have an attachment to uh, liberal democracy would regard it as desirable now. I mean, I know we're living through a period at the moment of when we're very sensitive to what seems to be, you know, an irreconcilable conflict. And so 
we want, of course, to think about the opposite of that. We want to think about unity and consensus and agreement. But I think it would be a big mistake politically to exaggerate the value of unity. Um, unity is one element of a, of a decent polity, but another element is robust uh, disagreement and debate. Um, so, uh, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to live in a world in, or a society anyway, in which uh, one particular metaphysical or religious uh, vision had, particularly when you think about the methods that would be required, the institutions and the methods and so on that would be required to bring about that kind of unity. I don't know if you've read recent, I read an article in the American Interest recently about something called the Chinese social credit system. This is going to be unveiled in 2020. It's already in place with the help of millions and millions of sensors that know what emails everyone's writing and what text messages they're sending and what bank transa financial transactions they're doing and television monitors, millions of them all over the country. Each citizen of China will be given a little uh, credit account. I think you start out with 100 credits. And depending on how nice you are and how civically minded you are and how generous you are and so forth, you will get uh, credits added to that or you will get credits taken away from it. That includes, for example, um, your relations with, with others. If your relatives do bad things and have credits taken away from them, you'll have credits taken away from you too. If your friends uh, have problems, you'll have problems. And I'm sure this will produce a lot of beneficial effects. It'll reduce corruption, it'll reduce crime, it will find terrorists, and so on and so forth. Um, but it, I think it, but it, would, it will also end up, you know, it, insofar as it's successful, producing a society that none of us would really want to live in. Um, and um, so anyway, I've, I've said my piece. <laughs> but I would ask where that's coming from. Like what, what, what set of, what mentality, what framework, what belief system is, is, it, is that representative of? Um, well, is what representative of? Uh, that social credit system, China. Um, well, communism, totalitarianism. Right. Um, but, there's a, but there's a relationship between, um, uh, that's a, it's a kind of a soft totalitarianism because it doesn't involve terror and coercion, it involves shaming, and uh, there's kind of an incentive system that most people in the society have no uh, sort of impact on framing, right? It's all done at the top by the Politburo and the planners and so on. So it, it's kind of despotic um, in nature, but uh, I, can't I can't imagine any other way of producing that level of consensus except through fairly coercive despotic means. Most religious societies you know, that we observe in history and today are, are like that. So that's a kind of harmony, right? But it's a harmony at the expense of individual freedom expression. I mean, this is the this would be a standard objection to a totalitarian regime is that yeah, it's sure. inhibiting uh, the individual and it's inhibiting the uh, expression of difference, uh, the expression of dissent, um, the liberty. Uh, to define one's own, um, you know, values within a larger kind of set of meta values that cohere the society, but it, it's a very restrictive kind of mode of, of governance. I mean, let's imagine a, a, a society where there are uh, multiple political parties uh, that are allowed to compete for attention, for investment of capital, for resources, and for power ultimately, and like. What if there was a party of the party of the divinization of matter, the di divinized matter party or something like that? And another party that, you know, the, the transcend, uh, the, you know, the universe or transcend mat materiality party. And there might be competing um, platforms, you know, around what, what how should society be organized? Uh, what, what interests uh, should it kind of weigh? Um, uh, su sustain, support, incentivize, uh, etc. I mean, I, I I wasn't trying to be facetiously challenging. I I I, I want I actually want to know, um, like how could we sort of make make that um, mediation, like mediate 
from the very abstract, very philosophical, very esoteric to the practical, pragmatic, and, and concrete. To Don's point earlier about you know the, the organs turning into chakras, I mean, I think that that may be not as concrete as is necessary. Uh, and, and also, it, to me, it would beg certain questions. Like, why create matter at all if you're just going to, you know, leave it, turn it into a chakra? Uh, why not have the matter and have the chakra and let them do what they do? So if we're talking about supermind uh, descending into the world, what's supermind going to do? Uh, and if that vision is not non-totalitarian, if, if that includes not only the kind of harmony of society, but also the free expression of individuality and the proliferation of new forms and creativity and the delight of existence, I, I want that's what I want to work towards. Uh, I'm not interested in the Democrats and the Republicans. I would be much more interested in the, you know, the matter divinizers. Uh, but I think some kind of translation or mediation needs to occur between the discourses. Um, and, you know, I'm, I, I'm very interested in the Auroville experiment because it seems to be an attempt to um, polit politicize uh, the spirituality. Uh, and I mean that in a positive sense, in the sense of create a polity, create a, pol uh, a human organ organism, a human organization based on the intuition and the ideas. So I would ask, okay, what, how can we develop that and how can we also translate it into terms that would be amenable to uh, you know, folks that are not going to go to Auroville and live there, or you know, join the worldwide cult, <laughs> what have you. And I mean that in the most loving way. I don't, you know, I get it. Kind of been in cults myself, <laughs> so um, that's kind of what I'm what I'm curious about, and, and I think getting at. And um, I appreciate you know the, uh, that we have to be pre realistic and pragmatic about it too. I mean, that's part of the positive mental, mental function. I think that Aurobindo and Gebser for that matter also was pointing to that, that the structures and the capacities that are not the ultimate can become transparent to it in a way that allows them to function towards it rather than, uh, in more life denying or, uh, uh stultifying uh, ways. And Kim is, has been waiting for a few minutes, so I wouldn't mind waiting, letting her in. Is that all right? Thanks for waiting. Hello. Hello, Hello Kim. <laughs> No. So we've, we've been talking about matter and divinization of matter. Oh, and wonderful. We're talking, and now we're approaching the political, perhaps, by saying, how can this be achieved? Fred mentioned in China, they're, they're um, forcing, in a sor sort of sense, um, what, what is it called? Good. Well, I know it's credits that they're it's basing it on. Credit system, but I, I wouldn't call it divinization in that case. I would call no. it <laughs> a black mirror episode. Yeah, specifically <laughs> nosedive. I think it, it was. So, yeah. Yeah, one, yeah, absolutely. I've had a lot of thoughts about this type of stuff um, before, maybe about the past couple of years, but I, I'm really inter interested in this idea of forced enlightenment. Um, of course, it's just myself thinking about this, so I'm not a political entity, so it's safe. And well, to an extent, but I've had ideas of like, how can we wake up society? How can we get everybody on the same page? Um, how can we reach the same level of consciousness? Not necessarily to a higher stage, but to just that stage where we can have a decent conversation with each other. Even even the best of us have trouble with that. And I, I read a science fiction novel this weekend that really touches on the spiritual side of the future. 
and it, I, I don't know where the next books will go, but um, it, it's really playing off the idea of there, there will be various political formations. There will be some groups that stick with maybe the Buddhist mentality, the communist mentality. And um, we mentioned that uh, the last session. Our, our Don kind of started it saying North Carolina is it's its own little bubble and around the world we're forming bubbles um, of great ideas of good communities. And we all sort of agreed that's, that's true. And I, I haven't dove deep into this, nor do we necessarily have to here, but it's, it's not necessarily a game, but approaching maybe the virtual reality world we're all on computers right now. It doesn't have to be some magical headset or some magical whatever, but we're approaching an exploratory realm through virtual reality, which we've been going through the past 30, 40, 50 years um, with the internet or computers in general. Mm -hmm. And that's a safe place. That's something you can, it doesn't have to be political on the political level yet. It'll still be the personal experimentational level. Um, so if, if it's not forced by some government, but it's a voluntary effort and there's been a few other people that have talked about spiritual, the, the next kind of spiritual requirements or spiritual, it'll be cool to be spiritual in a way, um, for lack of a better word, it'll, it'll be the norm to be seen it'll be nice to um well i just meditate we, we see it on meditation apps so i meditated for an hour today congratulations i'm doing a great job with my life um but as we progress away from just like the, um well i was just talking about making it a game but uh, so we it'll, it'll start out maybe as fun app like or whatever but then as we form the communities online we'll we'll have a better idea of what it will look like right now it's only seen in science fiction maybe or something like that but well if i could I, and i don't mean to turn this into a debate but i i think what i'm questioning is is whether everyone going spiritual is going to solve any political problems i mean for example um the zen buddhists of imperial japan were centrally instrumental in the rise of Japanese fascism. Um, uh, you can read about this in a book called Zen at War. I'm sorry, I can't remember the author right now. It was a real eye-opener when I read it about 10 years ago or whatever. Um, they were very spiritual. <laughs> but for them, the proper expression of their spirituality was, you know, training kamikaze pilots, uh, non-attachment, <laughs> you know. So I think it's a little naive to think that if we can that, that there's a there's an uh, there's a, there's a simple and reliable correlation between people attempting to be come quote unquote enlightened and kind of political enlightenment. I think that a lot of us are, are looking for right now. It's got to be much more complex than than any kind of talk like that would suggest. At least that's my sense. Yeah, and I agree with you. Any even if we go spiritual, it, there's we're still humans and there's still going to be the same problems, perhaps more. Um, we'll just know more about it maybe, or <laughs> know less about it, I don't know. But, um, you're on mute, sorry. You're on mute, Frederick. Actually, I was just saying yes, I, I understand and I agree and so on. I, mean, I think the political problem transcend, to talk about the transcendent, I think the political problem is fundamentally rooted in human nature, if I could put it that way, and it's, it transcends a lot of other, it's, it's, it's irreducible. It's, um, it's, it's always going to be a problem. There's never going to be a, sorry to use this phrase, final solution to the political problem. Human beings will always have clashing values. They will always have to find ways of communicating with one another, uh, compromising with one another, achieving consensus, uh, figuring out what matters and what doesn't. And, I think it's um, it's the wrong point of departure to think about 
politics in terms of solving that problem. That's actually an anti-political way of thinking. Uh, the solution of political problems is to get rid of politics and replace it by harmony. If we could only just agree on everything, that's not going to happen. And that's one way of looking at it. Is that possible? Probably not possible, but I would say it's not even desirable. I mean, I'm attached to societies in which people disagree and have different perspectives. And of course, we want to prevent that from reaching the kinds of forms of conflict that we're seeing today. Um, but that is another way of formulating what the political problem is. Um, anyway, that's my two cents on the show. When I think about when you guys talk about spirituality and then you give the kamikaze example and I'm like, well, that's not really spiritual to me in the way that I would sort of um, identify with uh, the outcome. Although I can see like if we were at war, maybe that would be an application. Um, I think the thing I have a hard time with um something that Eckhart said when I saw him last month in Banff was he was talking about this political you know realm and uh because he was being challenged as far as like the relevancy of his teachings in the political sphere and it was really funny to just watch him react to that um challenge um because I don't think he would have any sort of like uh, debate with anything that you've said, Frederick, uh, or um, just sort of a sensibility into what you're saying as being true in terms of human nature. But what he was more interested in was talking about the type of leadership that would come from presence and the way that he sort of describes being. And that conversation is interesting to me because, like, I don't necessarily have a framework that says I need to impose sort of awareness on everyone else. Um, although, when I think of imposing awareness on anyone, I think of like, I definitely try to do that with my boyfriend for sure. <laughs> um, but so I know like just with that, you know, sample of one, that's a failed experiment. <laughs> um, so really I'm constantly reminded to like do my own practice and focus on wh what I can do. Um, but Eckhart said something that I thought was really interesting and it felt true for me at least um, when I think about Trump and some of the um, just the, emotional intensity that I've had to deal with with my family even to have a conversation because we're all very pro-Trump and um, in an extreme kind of way, which they weren't when the election started. So it was really fascinating for me to see them sort of sort of mutate <laughs> as that became their only option. And um, so he was kind of like the butt of the jokes and then all of a sudden he was the only option. And so then all of a sudden there was this sort of mutation in how they engaged in the conversation with me. And I was fascinated by it, but Eckhart really pointed at this idea of like an individual. And I, the only individual I can think that to me was both spiritual and political is Martin Luther King, that I think did it really well and would be an example I would be sort of inspired by, um, you know, without any commentary on his, you know, personal moral uh, development or not. But just like as somebody that, that I feel like would be at least someone I could point to to say as an inspiration. Um, and so spirituality doesn't have to be sort of mystical um, in that sense. So I don't know. That's kind of where I take the conversation. Well, and Aurobindo was very political, too. Right? So that's... It's just there's so many thousands of pages of Aurobindo. <laughs> Mateo, can you summarize uh, the... Orbindo's political, I mean, he seemed to be pro-individual freedom, basically. Yeah, I would say he would be in agreement with everything that Frederick said. There's actually not, uh, that's not, he's, he's not defining unity in that way. He's saying, directing us all toward inner change. And there, there's a collection of six essays called, under the title War and Self-Determination, where he says over and over again that our outer systems are never going to change. They're always going to be human. It's the human that actually needs to change. And that's why they're, that's why they're doing the work and, and, and did the attempt that they, that they did was to change, to have us living from our souls rather than our egos. That's uh, they're, they're in complete agreement with everything that you, that, that you said. It's a, uh, yeah, and, and for him, unity is never divorced from mutuality and, and harmony. And 
we're still talking about the life divine, but it sounds like everybody's pointing toward, well, what's the process? What are the processes of integral yoga? And wow, I mean, there's, I don't, I, I wouldn't even, it, it's not even, I don't know. There's so many, there are so many beautiful things coming out of Oroville. I mean, I could talk for a long time about what's beautiful coming out of Oroville because I'm also on the board of directors of the Foundation for World Education. We grant out, we have a small foundation, $2 million, and we grant out about 70000 a year and small seed grants to Oroville and around the globe for uh, projects. So I get to, a lot, of, a lot of stuff comes across my desk. There's so many beautiful things. One thing I would bring up is awareness through the body. It's this, uh, uh, have you heard of awareness through the body? Nice, Kim. I mean, this is like a friend of mine said, training the young next generation of Jedi warriors. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 and it's employed in a lot of schools in Oroville and is, uh, is going around the globe at this point. Oh, there's so many things. A friend of mine, Oroville has a sticky history. I, I would like to say the Oroville's not a utopia. It often gets accused of being a cult and a utopia. And the difference between a utopia and Oroville is a utopia typically starts with founders and a mental construct saying, this is the way everyone should live life. This is the way it's going to be. Oroville is a living laboratory and all participants are, uh, the, the highest aspiration is that all participants are um, equal scientists in the laboratory working with their own specific form and their own uh, dharma in life and their own way of their own way of being personal uh, free will is uh, the major component of of integral yoga but the the processes of practice are are myriad the the symbol of the divine mother is uh, there's kind of 12 qualities that people work in small groups uh, to use it to inform decision-making processes processes and cohesion uh, while working together. There's been some incredible transformation and it's like starting with sincerity, starting in a meditative, from a meditative place and working with sincerity, the deep inner question, uh, humility and uh, um, gratitude, perseverance, aspiration, receptivity to the consciousness, uh, courage to progress. There's always an evolutionary arc so that when we come together in groups, there's an aspiration for goodness and generosity and equanimity and, and peace, which peace is a Peace is a form of higher consciousness. And uh, there's uh, people work with flowers and the spiritual significance of flowers to inform decision making processes. And there's a, it's, it's just there's a lot of experimentation going on. I mean, it's not um, there's no there. I can't say that there's no imposed outward anything because we're human. We're all living in the, we're all living in the human distortion. And on a simple level, part of the divinization might be lessening of the human distortion. And what does, what does, what is that? It's coming out of separativity of consciousness and seeing the divinity in, in all. It's not necessarily uh, any anything that's forced, but one of the like going back to that chapter on supermind, uh, I think he constantly brings it back to uh, those three sands. Asked the the mind actually knows these things. We we can say that killing my neighbor because he ran over my dog is not right and true it's it wouldn't be super mind acting if that was the action that i took when he accidentally ran over my dog he didn't they're alive and well just an example but, but yeah i don't i don't there's there's so many things on the practice of integral yoga and what the aspiration is and to me i've just never met anything more in my life and my explorations i haven't met any any wider aspiration and anything um, anything like worth kind of 
saying, wow, I'm really going to try to be a collaborative force in this. And the life divine is special, but it's good to know. It's really just kind of, it's his way of expressing an answer to the question, why? It's not the how, it's not, it's just, it's like a philosophical question of why. And, and he, part two is going to be beautiful because he does start diving into epistemology and knowledge by identity, uh, the logic of the logic of the, the logic of the infinite. And, and, uh, and if anyone wants poetry on the, wants to have a look at poetry on a supermentalized world and what that might look like, book 11 of Savitri is like, 40 or 50 pages of supermental poetry after I, I, I won't do, I won't have a monologue on Savitri right now, but book 11, the soul's, the soul's choice and the supreme consummation, the book of the everlasting day. It's uh, just filled with supermental vision, drishti, supermental hearing, shruti, which he goes back to a lot in practice also, vision and hearing. It knows a lot. It seems like there's knowledge by identity in those realms that can detect a lot faster than the mind ever can, but these things are developing and developable. I wanted to share a little bit um, this question. I agree, Frederick, with your arguments about the politics of the business. Um, I come to this context, so it'll have become evident that uh, that I am a practicing scientist, that I have been a practicing scientist for the last 30, 40 years. Um, and I, I originally got interested in how to how to explain science to the public and so bear with me because it will come back around so how to explain science to the public and one of the things that became clear to me is that science is not good scientists in in particular are not good about explaining things in a way that's meaningful to people in their day-to-day -day lives. The scientists can talk all they like about the science, but if they don't make it meaningful to people, uh, they don't get the message across. And so I started to work with artists, and so I spent about uh, 20 years of my career working with artists and using the arts as a way of bridging the gap uh, by making the presentation of science more meaningful through the work of artists. But uh, having got done through that, it became clear to me that the missing piece was meaning in this spiritual sense. So, uh, so I'm now on the second arc where I'm seeking to find ways to speak to the public. So I'm still explaining science. And I'm still working with artists, but I want to use, so I, I'm not, I don't think I'm naively assuming that spiritual people are in some sense better than others. It's just that to me, the spirit speaks to a level of meaning that does engage with people in ways that are interesting. And so that's in a way while I'm here, in, and why I'm reading Aurobindo, uh, because it's part of this quest to link these three domains, science, art, and spirituality. And I'm not an, in, I'm not, no part of the integral community except my association with the Infinite Conversations site, which I suppose gives me some integral credits these days, I don't know, but uh, <laughs> reading Gebser, so I guess I'll get more credits that way. <laughs> Integral social credits? <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'm not part of the integral community in any way. And so it's more, it's, I'm a kind of an outsider looking at this whole process. 
um, and trying to fit things in with it. So I'm very interested in, or have been, though I'm interested in the political side of it, but it's not the political side per se that excites me. It's this search for meaning that excites me. Um, Jeffrey, when you were talking about, um, you know, just all of a sudden I jumped in my, my mind to today I was on the next door app. Um, and there's a book club for your neighborhood. And it was like, the introductory question was, well, what are you reading now? And I thought, well, <laughs> you know, and then I looked through the stream and I saw what other people were reading, you know, romance, mystery, you know, novels. And I thought, should I just like throw that out there and see what happens <laughs> just to like as a experiment on my neighbors? <laughs> um, so like when I think of like something being accessible to, I feel like, um, this kind of reading still requires me to translate a lot in terms of um, my direct experience and the spiritual, you know, relationship. You guys were talking about matter and divin divinization of matter, I think, when I came in. So I'd kind of like to jump back to that for a second, because that's one thing about this reading that really excites me, um, particularly as it pertains to a course in shamanism that I'm getting ready to kick off next week. And this idea of like this sort of, you know, experience that I've had spiritually where I just ask the question, who, who am I? And sort of, sort of exhaustively for like a couple of weeks, I journaled on it and just sort of like kept asking that question. Um, before I had a spiritual context, I was just really curious because I saw it in a sci-fi film or series. And what, what finally came for me was this experience of like everything sort of turning into sort of like particles of energy and then sort of like disappearing but like feeling this like really deep felt sense of like peace and just sort of like oneness and like love, but like also like in the backdrop of that um, and through Muji's sort of coaching, I've kind of understood that like in that experience, the very backdrop of that was sort of like the space that all that was happening in even, and I didn't even have the subtlety to recognize it at the time because I was so, you know, enthralled with the spiritual sort of overwhelm of like, wow, this is so cool. This is so different than my normal reality. And then coming back to, my immediate surroundings, which was sitting with my boss, who was my military supervisor working for the government and not really being able to all of a sudden translate. Like I just had this, like the best experience of my life and I have no one to talk to about it. And by the way, if I say anything to this guy, he's going to think I'm nuts. And so, and then it being years before I could even integrate that experience in any kind of meaningful way. And I think I've still been trying to integrate or at least understand that experience in a meaningful way since then. So that's like pretty much driven my entire life for the last 20 years to sort of have some way of um, both sharing and sort of understanding, but communicating, but co-experiencing that. Um, and my reconnection with like nature, like Mother Earth nature in the last year has really sort of expanded this just relationship to matter in a way where I can kind of like feel feel like that connection again where like like matter itself is sort of like I can feel that aliveness like not just like think about it and it excites me because I I read him to say that he sort of like sort of like presumes that as just like that's his ex his actual direct experience of that he's not just talking about it and I just wonder if like other people experience that too and if it's sort of intermittent or if it's something that's sort of you know you know like what are people's actual experiences as they sort of relate to the reading on this topic. I'm, I need to leave. I, I think I better get back to my family. Oh, thank you, everybody. Thanks, Kim. Bye, Darwin. Bye, Darwin. Hmm. I was going to say we need two hours to respond to your question. Yeah, that, that, that question should have come at the beginning. It kind of did, but like we, um, maybe that for me, like I was wondering, like, what is the heart of the matter? Like what are we getting at? Because Aurobindo keeps coming back to Satchitananda. And in the end, it seems like that's always the heart of the matter. Like you go in any direction, whether you go evolutionary, you go involutionary, it comes back to that. But that's 
not just an idea. That's not just something you visualize or imagine or conceive. It's right. <laughs> so, um, you know, and, and it's not like you can say, well, I have experienced it and I haven't because you cannot not experience it. That's the only thing that you're ever experiencing. You just see it through these multi different forms. And I think, I mean, the, like this play of forms is like more and more interesting forms or more and more capacious forms that hold more, you know, being consciousness bliss. Uh, dancing, that's what Lauren said. Uh, I, I, I think that, that I feel that too, like when I'm moving, like when things are moving, right? If I go for a walk and I see some birds, kind of like a flock of birds and the pattern that they make in the sky and that's happening over here you talk about nature and then you know a, a breeze blows like come you know from from the side of me and i'm talking to somebody at the same time and he's telling me about his childhood and it's all part of one <laughs> right so but but uh it's very uh, it is very hard to talk about but that's part of the impetus i think for poetry, for artfulness, for expression, for, uh, and I don't mean just verbal, but like my friend who was hanging out all week, he's a cook, he makes food. And he just, I can just know, I just know because of the kind of the, the similar resonance that this is like his expression of divinity. And I imagine that we all have that and like, we're all sort of working on that. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> well, Marco, just real quick. I, I, I feel like that's true. Like, um, I think that was the biggest struggle is sort of like tying together this sort of like, ex like state experience was sort of like seeing how that was just that the core of that was always there, right? Like as an experience, because I felt like I, my attention was so distracted on these different forms or judgments or contractions, like pain, you know, or avoidance of pain. And like this sort of, sort of like, well, you know, the very sort of like uh, immature sort of like spiritual view of like, oh, well, you know, if God loved me, why does this suck so bad? <laughs> you know, like even just like struggles with those types of questions in my development, which made me, not able to really receive fully my direct experience. So what I go to when I hear you talk is I think about that statement about, a, you know, delighting in whatever's arising and having that capacity. But I think what keeps me from that personally is judgments that I have or um, things that I want to be, you know, in some other way, which I don't think is a bad thing necessarily, particularly if it's in the face of injustice or suffering. But so I don't want to lose my sensitivity and compassion for like, you know, trying to like serve in some way or, you know, like, you know, uh, not just right or wrong, but like, you know, offer something that's maybe a better, more, uh, has more capacity for more people to experience more joy and expressions like you're talking about. And so that really sort of like excites me um, in terms of like this idea of like delighting in, in what is and that that's just hard sometimes, at least in my experience of the world. Well, that's, that's the crucified cat. Um, but I don't think we should. We had to mention the cat. I had to, anyway. Um, but, ah! I keep wondering if it's Schrodinger's cat that you're talking about. <laughs> John's cat, originally. So um, well, I should also get back to my family and dinner and so forth. So. Um, I'd like to ask, I'd like to ask, once we're done, I'd like to ask the group a question off recording. Okay. Yeah. Any, any other thoughts before I, I'll, I can stop the recording? Okay. Bye-bye. Everybody. Bye. Out there, not here. <laughs>